want you to imagine what it would be like to serve life in prison for a crime you didn't commit against a person you'd never met on the false testimony of a person you barely knew. I said again, imagine what it would be like to serve your life in prison for a crime you didn't commit against a person you'd never met based on the made-up testimony of a man you barely knew. While you're thinking about that, I've got a picture I want to show you. Uh, this is 75-year-old Richard Phillips, and according to officials at the University of Michigan, he is the uh, person who has served the most time in prison in history, uh, at least in the United States, for a crime that he did not commit. He, he served a total of just over 46 years in a Michigan State penitentiary. It's kind of a long and convoluted story as to how it all went down, but he was implicated in the murder of a person that he'd never met by a distant acquaintance of his named Fred Mitchell. And even though he had no motive, there were no other eyewitnesses and no physical evidence uh, linking him to the crime, he was nonetheless convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in April of 1971. Now, for the first couple years he was in prison, he did what anybody would have done, and he filed three different appeals to try and get a new trial or at least to get his conviction overturned if he could. But all three times, his appeal was denied. It was then that his wife of eight years uh, sent notice that she was going to divorce him and that she, neither she nor their two children would ever come visit him in prison because she didn't want her two children to be exposed to that environment. At that point, two years into a lifetime sentence, Mr. Phillips did his best to accept his faith, and he started taking classes, he started writing poetry, and he started teaching himself to paint. Now, fast forward, January 1st, 1979, and Mr. Phillips was sitting alone in his cell when he was interrupted by another uh, prisoner there who told him that he had just seen Fred Mitchell, the man who made up the story, that put Richard Phillips in prison to begin with in the prison's cafeteria. So, obviously, that would be news to his ears. So he went down to the cafeteria. He confirmed that it was his. He confirmed that it was him. And then all of a sudden, he came up with this plan for how he would exact his revenge on the person whose lie had ruined his life and stolen his freedom. Because up until that point, he had been a model prisoner. Uh, he had earned a position in the part of the prison where they made license plate so he had access to all kinds of metal all kinds of tools so he began to formulate this plan that he would he would make a knife and then one day he would find Fred Mitchell in the the one part of the prison yard where the cameras wouldn't pick him up he would sneak up behind him he would take his revenge and most likely he would probably get away with it and if he didn't get away with it what difference does it make because he's already serving life in prison without the possibility of parole imagine that you've been in prison for seven years for something you didn't do and you were confronted with the opportunity to exact your revenge on the person who made up the story that put you there. What would you do? How about this? Imagine what it would be like to spend your life in prison all because of a lie. Give your Bible. I want you to open up to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. Last weekend we kicked off this series that we're calling uh, rewired, and we're talking about some practical ways that all of us can close this gap between uh, who we are and who God created us to be. So if you missed uh, last weekend's message, I hope you'll check it out because everything we talk about over the next couple of weeks will make more sense if you listen uh, to last week. But just to remind you of where we've been last week, and we said that every single day from the time you get up in the morning until the time you, you close your eyes at night for the last time, your brain is literally being Rewired. Every, even though you don't realize it's happening every single day, your brain is reorganizing itself, it's redesigning itself, and you're being rewired around your thoughts. Now, that's a process that can either work in your favor or it can work against you. It just depends on what it is that you're, you're thinking about. And our goal is over these next few weeks is, is to try to create some habits and some routines where that will actually begin to work for us so that we can become the people that God created us to be. But if you're keeping track, here's the, the key principle we want to think about today. To change my life, I have to change my thinking. To change my life, I have to change my thinking. Now, one of the things we talked about last week, and that's worth repeating, is that, that hope is not a strategy. I mean, all of us wish we were in better shape. 
All of us wish our finances were in better shape. All of us wish our relationships were better. But here's the deal. Just, just setting back and hoping those things come true or, or wishing those things were true is not a strategy. That doesn't do anything to, to make those things become a reality. For something to change, for something to get better, things first have to, to change. And one of the primary things that has to change, according to the Apostle Paul, is the, the way we think. Here's the way he put it in Romans 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So according to Paul, there are these two processes that are taking place simultaneously, and we don't even realize they're happening, but every single day we're either being conformed to the pattern of this world or we're being transformed more and more into the image of God. And the thing that determines whether or not we're being conformed or, or transformed is, is how we think. And so Paul says the path to transformation is the renewing of your mind. So whether you call it renewing, rewiring, recreating, redesigning, whatever you want to call it, he's describing a process whereby our minds are transformed and then eventually our lives are transformed because if you want to change your life, you have to change the way you think. The question then is, is how do you change your thinking? If you have your Bible, your phone, open to 2 Corinthians 10. Uh, 2 Corinthians is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. It's a church that years earlier he had helped to plant, but now he's been gone a little while, and there are these false teachers who have shown up, and they're, they're trying to seize control of the church. And one of the ways they're trying to do that is by discrediting Paul, so they're throwing all these false accusations at him. The reason that's important is when you get to chapter 10, the first couple of verses, you realize that you're only hearing one side of the conversation. Paul is responding to something, and you don't know what prompted it, but all you can see is his response. But then right in the middle of that, as he tries to answer these false accusations, he gives us a very simple three-step process for how all of us uh, can put ourselves in a position to have our minds renewed. So if you want to look at this with me, ver chapter 10, start in verse Verse 1, by the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold towards you in a way. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. So at the end of verse 2, Paul says there are certain people who operate according to the standards of the world. He's talking about people who have been conformed to the image of the world. They think like the world thinks. They value what the world values. Uh, they, they believe what the world believes, and they fight like the world fights. But then you get in verse 3, and Paul says that as followers of Jesus, that's not us. We may live in the world, but we're not of this world, meaning that we don't we don't operate the same way that most of the people around us operate. We don't value the same things. We don't believe the same things. And we certainly don't fight in the same way. And we don't think in the same way. Most people around the world, they allow their thoughts to control them. But Paul says, if you're a follower of Jesus, your job is to learn to control your thoughts rather than allowing your thoughts to control you. Now check out verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. If you're keeping track, here's the first step in this process. It starts when you, you name the stronghold. Last weekend, we talked some about this process that happens. Every time a, a thought enters your mind, it produces what's called a neurochemical reaction, which in some small way literally changes that part of your brain. If you could see this on an MRI, you could see this start to happen. Scientists refer to it as the process of neuroplasticity. It's defined as the ability of these neural networks in your brain to change through growth and reorganization. So it's because of neuroplasticity that you're able to learn new things that you're able to think in new categories and change your thinking in the first place but what happens is every time a thought enters your mind it produces this neurochemical reaction and over time as as one thought leads to another thought leads to another thought leads to another thought they form together in this this chain they're called 
associative links and it becomes sort of normal to you so you you have the first thought and then you go to the second they're all sort of chained together they're linked together and then what happens is if you continue down those same paths often enough they develop what are called neural pathways they're these like highways that that run through your mind and they they become familiar to you because you've been down them so often so whatever roads you take when you go home when you get on that road you don't have to think about it you know where it leads you know every turn you know all the scenery because it feels normal to you I compare it to the process of your you're driving down a road that you've been down hundreds of times and the the music's cranked up and the windows are rolled down and your hair's blown in the breeze uh, because you feel you feel normal because it's a path that you've been down hundreds of thousands of times before here's another way to think about it. last weekend we talked about the 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 process of, of recognizing the ruts, finding those places in your life where you've already allowed the world to, to squeeze you into its mold. Well, you know what a rut is. If you drive over, over ground that's wet, uh, the tire is, of your vehicle is going to sink down to that ground, and if you drive over it long enough and often enough, it's going to create a rut. And the more times you do that, the more times you drive in the same rut, the deeper it's going to get. And every time it dries, it's going to get a little bit firmer. And so what will eventually happen is you'll pull your vehicle into that old familiar rut. Your tires will, will sink down to where they always go, and you don't have to even steer the car anymore. The rut just kind of guides your tires along. Some of you have seen that process. Well, what happens if you decide you want to get out of that rut? You turn your wheel hard to the right, you turn hard to the left, and the rut pulls you back in because you you meet this resistance. It's almost impossible to get out of a rut if it goes deep enough and long enough. And it's at that point that Paul says you've gone from a rut to a stronghold. A stronghold is something that you, you can't escape. It's something that, that holds you as a prisoner. So you might think about a maximum security prison. No matter how hard you try, you can't seem to find a way out. But what, what Paul's talking about here is not a physical stronghold. It's a, it's a mental stronghold. And it can come in a lot of different forms. For example, for some people, the stronghold that keeps them, holds them hostage is a lie that they believe. Maybe somewhere along the line, somebody told them, hey, you're not smart enough, not pretty enough, you're not impressive enough, you're never going to amount to anything, you're always going to be a disappointment. And for whatever reason, they started to believe that. And so as they look back over their life, they've spent their life held hostage by something that wasn't true, and it's never true. For other people, the stronghold might be an addiction that they can't seem to kick or a destructive habit that they've allowed to develop started out as something simple, something you can control. But now every time, as soon as you wake up in the morning, you think about that next drink, that, that next hit, that next bet, that next purchase, even that next meal. For some people, the stronghold that holds them hostage is some pain from their past that they've refused to deal with. Somebody they trusted betrayed them. Somebody they loved hurt them. Somebody they assumed would always be there either walked out or died unexpectedly. Or maybe they made a bad decision. Maybe they've been a victim of a crime. Maybe it's their own fault. They wind up taking a wrong path that hurt them and hurt the people around them. And now it might have been something that was 10 years ago or 20 years ago or even 30 years ago, but to them it feels like it was yesterday. And the scars are still still fresh strongholds can also take the form of a worldview that you've adopted one of the interesting things that sociologists have begun to write about in recent years and some of you some of you've noticed this you've seen this happen a lot of us have experiences it is how in our modern culture there are people who have decided to to base their identity primarily on some sort of political belief and so that becomes the the lens through which they view every other issue is their their political view and so sometimes you'll hear these things referred to as isms could be liberalism could be conservatism could be environmentalism could be humanism marxism materialism environmentalism globalism nationalism i mean it could just you go on down the list and so what happens to a lot of people is they choose hey that's going to be the primary lens through which I view reality. And then they go through life and they, they run up against something that doesn't seem to fit what they know or what they've been told is true. And they feel, they feel trapped. There's this collision between what they're seeing and what they've been told and they don't know how to make sense of it. So they're, they're trapped. It's like they've placed themselves in a prison from which they can't escape. So what do you do when you find yourself trapped by a stronghold 
that you can't seem to break out of. If you go back to verse 4, Paul says that as followers of Jesus, we have access to divine power that can destroy or demolish all of the different strongholds that that hold us hostage. The Greek word that gets translated as power is the same word from which we get our English word dynamite. So he's talking about this dynamic, explosive, all-consuming power of God to destroy the strongholds that hold us hostage. But, But here's the deal. Before you can destroy a stronghold, you first have to identify. I mean, before you can launch a missile, you first have to be willing to to have a target. So the the first step in all of this is for us to get honest about the lies we've believed, the addictions that we've developed, the pain that we've refused to deal with, and the corrupted worldviews that we've adopted. And then, once you identify the stronghold, you go to the second step, and you challenge the argument. Verse 5, Paul writes, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Throughout this section of 2 Corinthians, Paul uses all this this military language. He's all the time talking about attacking, destroying, conquering, demolishing. Because for Paul, this is not something that you just set back and, you know, you hope it, it works itself out. For Paul, he knows this is something you have to attack head on. Because if you don't, what happens is that that stronghold just keeps getting stronger. That rut just keeps getting deeper. So Paul says, before you can move forward, you've got to identify it, and then you've got to challenge it. You've got to, you've got to attack it. Every year, at the end of the year, right before the New Year starts, most uh, major newspapers will, will run a series of what they call year-in-review articles. You've probably seen these. They go back, they identify all the major headlines, and then normally they give you a list of all the celebrities or famous people, important people that have died over the previous 12 months. But something they've started doing in the last three or four years that's interesting, in addition to all that other stuff, they now go back and they identify the top three or four fake news stories of the previous year, things that have gone viral that turned out not to be true. Now, you know, with the explosion of the Internet, we're living in what sociologists now call the era of fake news. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. It was the great Abraham Lincoln who said it best. Don't believe everything you read on the Internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. Some of you are going to get that later. You're going to think, that makes sense now. Uh, don't believe everything you read. And, and as crazy as all the, you know, the made-up quotes and the, the fabricated stories and the Facebook posts and all that stuff, as crazy as all that gets, there are actually some other lies that are more destructive than even those things that most people just sort of accept as being true without ever really thinking about it. There's really too many to list, but let me just give you an example of three of the Three of the big ones. The first one, a lot of people in our culture have accepted the lie that it doesn't matter what you do as long as it makes you happy. And it sounds good as a slogan, you know, you just do you, just, you know, follow your heart, just be yourself. But, but what happens, like, what happens when your heart leads you astray? Or what happens when the thing that makes you happy is something that hurts other people? Here's another one that's really popular. It's the lie that there's no such thing as right and wrong, and true, all truth is, is relative. So what's true for you might not be true for me, and what's true for me probably not true for you, and everybody should just sort of do whatever they think is, is best for them. And usually the way it gets applied is we pick out some controversial issue, and we say, you know, I don't feel comfortable with that. I don't think that's true for me, but it must be okay for them. It might be, might be it's obviously not, not wrong for them. But if you follow that line of reasoning, to its logical conclusion, where do you wind up? I mean, if you can't say that, that something's wrong, then how can you say that, that anything is wrong? I mean, if one thing can't be wrong, then nothing can be wrong. One more lie that's grown increasingly popular in our culture is the idea that success will make you happy. One writer calls that the myth of self-sufficiency. It's the idea, if I can just win one more contest... If I can just close one more deal, if I can make one more dollar, if I can buy one more thing that I really want, then I'll finally be happy. But, but that's not true, and deep down inside, you know that's not true. Just a couple weeks ago, a columnist in the New York Times referenced a study. They, they uh, interviewed a couple hundred people all on their deathbed, all within days of dying. They asked them the question, as you look back over your life, what is the thing that made you the most happy? What is it that brought you the most joy? Out of 200 people, you know how many people mention their career, their net worth, or any accomplishments? Zero. You know what they mentioned? Their relationships with other people 
And if they were a follower of Jesus, they mentioned their relationship with God. See, sometimes all you have to do to see through the fog is just, just hit the pause button and ask some questions. Questions like, you know, what's the logical conclusion to this line of reasoning? And is it something I can live with? Or maybe you could ask it this way. If everybody in the world believed this, or if, if everybody in the world believed what I believe, what kind of world would we have? Or maybe the most important question is to ask, you identify the thought, you, 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 you identify that argument, you name it, and then you say, what does God say about this? And you go to the Bible and you just compare what God said to what everybody else believes, and you have to ask yourself, uh, which one of these am I going to go with? See, right now we find ourselves living in a world in which there's all kinds of people that want to correct the Bible. When the truth is, it's our job to let the Bible correct us and if you do that you can challenge some of those arguments and that leads to the third thing so you name the stronghold you challenge the argument and then finally you correct the thought Paul says we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to God. Again, he's using this military language. To, to take something captive means to conquer it or to control it. So again, Paul is saying, as a follower of Jesus, you should, be, you should be growing in your ability to control your thoughts rather than allowing your thoughts to control you. But there's a challenge in all of that, and you know what it is because you struggle with it just like I do. According to researchers, the average American, 2022 is exposed to somewhere between 4,000 and 10,000 unique messages every single day. It's the commercials you see on TV, the ads you see on the internet, the social media posts you scroll through, the text messages, the emails, the phone calls, the conversations. I mean, all of it adds up, and most of that we assume is harmless. I mean, you figured out how to filter through stuff, but the danger is that every message you have, every message you receive has the potential to create a thought, and every thought, as you already know, every thought that enters your mind has the potential to rewire your brain and create a highway that can lead you somewhere that will ultimately destroy you. So what do you do? One of the things we stressed last weekend is when it comes to your habits, they either work for you or against you. They can either be part of the process of you being conformed to the pattern of this world, or they can lead to your transformation. It all depends on what you do and how you do it. That's something I want to show you. Earlier in the first service, I almost blinded myself with this. It was interesting. Uh, earlier, Anita read... The memory verse, Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. If you're like me, whenever I think about that, normally I think about a spotlight or a floodlight, maybe a motion light like you would have on the outside of your house, and it lights up this huge area so that you can see from every direction. But that's not what Paul's talking about. What Paul's talking about here would something be, would be something akin to this. It's a lantern or a small lamp. And it's the kind of thing if you were going through the woods on a dark night, you would you carry that with you. And what it's meant to do is not show you the entire area. It's not meant to, to show you everything, every possible danger in every possible corner. It's meant to show you the area directly in front of you. It shows you enough so that you can see the next step to take, and you might see the general area right around you. But beyond that, it doesn't do much. The other thing about one of these small lamps or one of these lanterns is if, if it's a dark night, just imagine it's, it's dark in here, and I put this over here. If I stand too far away from it, like if I get over here, I can still see the light, but the light is not valuable to me. I can't really stand in the light. I mean, I can see what's around the light, but I can't see what's around me. In order for the lamp and the light to be valuable to me, I've got to stay close to it. And the closer I am to it, the more I can see, the more it lights up my path. And that's exactly what David is talking about in Psalm 119. For the, the light of the Scripture to be valuable to me, I've got to stay close to it. And so every single day, you know this, we're building these, 
these neural pathways in our minds that's already happening we're making connections we're creating narratives we're processing information we're drawing conclusions and the whole time these things are happening our brains are literally rewiring themselves and reorganizing themselves that means the most important thing i can do on a day-to-day basis is to keep shining the light of god's word and stay as close as i possibly can to the light and let it light up the pathways in my mind and redirect those pathways take them in a new direction it leads me closer to the person that god created to me i mean if you're going to be building highways anyway which the, the everything that we know about the way the brain works says that's happening whether you want it to happen or not if you're going to be building roads anyway you might as well build roads that are going to take you closer to where you want to be rather than further away and the best way to do that is to stay close to the lamp and the light of god's word one ancient philosopher said it this way watch your thoughts they become your words watch your words they become your actions watch your actions they become your habits watch your habits they become your character watch your character it becomes your destiny or another way to say it would be to say to change my life I've got to change my thinking several months after he first spotted Fred Mitchell, the man whose lie had put him in prison in January of 1979. Several months later, Richard Phillips saw the opportunity that he'd been waiting for to exact his revenge. As he slowly made his way across that prison yard, he could feel the cold, sharp edge of the homemade knife he'd spent months fashioning, digging into his skin as it was hidden under the sleeve of his shirt. As he methodically made his way across the yard he knew that that each step brought him closer to getting even with the man who literally had ruined his life and stolen his freedom i mean this was the moment that he had been dreaming about every night for years and it finally arrived but then the strangest thing happened when he was about 10 yards behind Fred Mitchell. Fred Mitchell's looking one direction. He's sneaking up behind him. Fred Mitchell has no idea he's there. He begins to pull the knife out of his sleeve and he can feel this moment. He can feel the tension rising. He can feel his pulse rate increasing. And all of a sudden, he hears this voice. And it's a voice that echoes through his mind that says, don't kill him. Everybody believes you're a murderer. And if you do this, you'll prove them right don't do it don't kill him or everything they said about you will be true the way he tells the story he stopped in his tracks and he made a decision that changed the course of his life he turned around threw the knife in a trash can and went back to his cell where he waited to make it worse About six weeks later, Fred Mitchell, the man who had lied about him and put him in prison, was himself released from prison and went free while Richard Phillips continued to wait. And you talk about about rubbing salt in a wound. Can you imagine what that would be like? That was in the fall of 1979. Fast forward, 2015. There's a retired circuit court judge named Helen Brown from Michigan who began to, to dig into the backstory of his case that had led to his conviction. And the more she investigated, the more she realized that a grave injustice had been done. But even then, even then, it took three more years for Mr. Phillips to prove his case, be exonerated. And finally, on March 28, 2018, after spending a little more than 46 years in prison for a crime he did not commit against a person he'd never met that took place in a, in a location that he was nowhere near, walked out of prison a free man. I have a picture I want to show you. Today, 75 years old, lives in a small apartment in Detroit. You can see behind him are some of his paintings. I said earlier he he taught himself to paint in prison so what he did when he got out he opened up a small art studio and there's a website where you can actually buy some of these paintings and some of them bring thousands of dollars and that's his life 
Imagine what it would be like to spend your life in prison because of a lie. The more I thought about this story, though, the only thing that would make it worse, the only thing that would make this worse that I could think of would be if for, if for some reason you started to believe the lie, too. The thing about Richard Phillips is he refused to believe about himself what everybody else told him was true. And because of that, as David said, the truth eventually set him free. You know, there's a lot of us, our brains have tricked us into believing some stuff that's not true. And I don't know what it is for you, but there's probably something that you believe about yourself. It's just not true. Maybe it's a lie that needs to be corrected. Maybe it's a stronghold that needs to be named. Maybe it's some pain you need to deal with. Maybe it's even a worldview that needs to be challenged and then transformed. If nothing else, if nothing else, you've probably got some, some highways running through your mind right now that you've built these, these big, beautiful lanes and they're going someplace that you really don't want to go. And you know that. And what you need to do is pull up some of that old pavement Take the light of God's word and let him shine it on a new path and take you in a new direction. I want you to stand with me. We're going to sing one final song together. And if you want to pray with somebody, um, you, you, we're, we'll be glad to do that. Dave and I will be here. If you're watching at home and you've got questions, just reach out to us. There's a way to do that, and we'll be glad to help you.